Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna go over five worked examples on motion time graphs. Now, if you haven't already done so, check out my previous video covering the theory on this topic, and that way you'll be able to apply what you learned in that video to this one. Let's get started. Question one says that a ball is thrown against a wall with a constant speed of three meters per second. It takes two seconds to reach the wall from its starting position, rebounds, and then returns to the starting position after a further two seconds. So you'll see that in the picture. So you'll see it's traveling for two seconds this way at three meters per second, hits the wall, and returns back to the starting point over another two seconds. Part A says sketch a speed time graph of the motion. Numerical values are required on both axes. Well, the question's telling us that the ball is traveling at a constant speed, so we're gonna have a graph that shows a constant speed, and it's happening over four seconds in total. So if I draw the axes first of all of the graph, we then put in our labels, so we've got speed meters per second and time in seconds. We can then draw our line across the way, that's our constant speed, our straight horizontal line, and we can then put in our numerical values. So we've got three over here for the constant speed of three meters per second, and we've got the time showing a total of four seconds. Seconds. Part B says to sketch a velocity time graph of the motion this time, numerical values are required on both axes. So in part A we drew a speed time graph whereas now we're asked for a velocity time graph. So remember the difference between a velocity time graph and a speed time graph is that velocity time graphs can show negative values because in velocity time graphs we can go below the x-axis and show motion going in the opposite direction. So if we do that and draw our axis first of all, we can then put in our labels, velocity meters per second and time in seconds. And then sketching what this would look like, it would be a straight line down the way going through a velocity of zero meters per second here. If I put in my numbers now, we've got three meters per second over here. And after two seconds, the ball actually reaches zero meters per second as it collides with the wall. So the ball in this case will slow down and slow down until it hits the wall, at which point it reaches zero meters per second. And then it starts traveling in the other direction up to a speed of minus three meters per second. Now the reason it's gonna be minus at this point is because it's traveling in the opposite direction that it was to begin with. And you should be able to see a clear difference here between this graph and the one that we drew in part A for speed versus time. Question two says that a velocity time graph for a moving object is shown below. So we've got velocity in meters per second and time in seconds, and we've got an object traveling with this motion from A to B to C to D. And part A says to describe the motion of the object between the points A and B, B and C, and C and D. Well, if we look at A to B, that is gonna be a uniform acceleration or a constant acceleration because we've got a positively sloping line from A to B. From B to C, we've got a straight horizontal line, which means a constant velocity. And from C to D, we've got a uniform deceleration or a constant deceleration because it's a negatively sloping line. Part B says to find the total distance, the magnitude of displacement traveled by the object. So that means we don't need a direction, we just need a total distance, a magnitude of displacement. Now remember to find distance or magnitude of displacement from a velocity time graph, we need to calculate the area under the graph, or the area between the x-axis and the line. So distance is equal to the area under the velocity time graph. And if we look back at the picture here, we've got three different shapes. It's already split up for us. So we've got a triangle, a rectangle, and a triangle. So we need to work out the area of all of these three and then add them together to give us our total distance. So doing that, we have a half times base times height plus length times breadth plus a half times base times height. So those two are for the triangles and that's for the rectangle. And if we plug in the numbers, we get a half times four times 15 for the first triangle, plus four times 15 for the rectangle, plus a half times two times 15 for the second triangle. Plugging that into your calculator should then give you an answer of 105 meters. Part C says to sketch an acceleration time graph for the motion. Now to sketch an acceleration time graph, we first need to find the acceleration at each stage on the graph. So to do that, we're gonna use the acceleration equation, A equals V minus U over T, but first of all, if we look at B to C, you'll remember that we said that B to C was a constant velocity. So if an object is traveling with a constant velocity, then it cannot be accelerating as well. So that means that the acceleration for B to C must be zero. So we have the A equals zero meters per second squared since it's a constant velocity. If we look at the motion from A to B now, it's the positively sloping line up the way. And if we're trying to find acceleration, we know the initial speed is zero meters per second and the final speed is 15 meters per second. And that happens over a time of four seconds. So plugging that into our equation A equals V minus U over T, we get 15 minus zero divided by four, which gives a final answer of 3.75 meters per second squared. Doing the same now for C to D, we have the A equals question mark, U equals 15 meters per second this time because we start at that speed, 
and then our final speed is zero because the object comes to a stop and that happens over a time of two seconds. So writing down our equation, a equals v minus u over t, substituting in the numbers, we get zero minus 15 divided by two, which gives us minus 7.5 meters per second squared. We should be expecting a negative acceleration because remember from c to d we had a uniform deceleration. Now we can use those three values on our acceleration time graph. So sketching our axis first of all, we can then put in our labels. So we've got a in meters per second squared and time in seconds. Then we need to put in our numbers so that we know where we're gonna draw the lines. So we have 3.75 here, we have a time of 4, 8 and 10 seconds and we've got an acceleration down here of minus 7.5 meters per second squared. So we found out the first acceleration was 3.75 meters per second and that happened over a time of 4 seconds. So drawing that line there and I'm going to draw a dashed line down to the x-axis just because that's where we're going next. You don't need to use dashed lines here, you could use solid lines if you want to. You don't actually need any lines at all. We then have our acceleration from B to C of 0 meters per second squared so that's going to go from 4 to 8 seconds along there and then from 8 to 10 seconds we have an acceleration or a negative acceleration, a deceleration of minus 7.5 meters per second squared. And that is what our acceleration time graph looks like to finish with. Question 3 is very similar to question 2 but this time we have motion below the x-axis for the velocity time graph and it says the velocity time graph for an object is shown below. So we have an object going from A to B, from B to C, from C to D, D to E and then E to F and F to G. Part A says describe the motion of the object at each stage. Well, just like in question 2, from A to B we have a uniform acceleration because we've got a positively sloping line. From B to C we have a constant velocity because it's a straight horizontal line. And from C to D we have a uniform deceleration or a constant deceleration because of that negatively sloping line. Next we have D to E. Now notice that we've gone below the x-axis which means that our object must have changed direction. So going from D to E, this time we're starting at 0 meters per second up to minus 10 meters per second. So remember the minus just means it's going in the opposite direction. So we must be uniformly accelerating in this direction. So from D to E we have a uniform acceleration in the opposite direction. From E to F we have a constant velocity again in that same direction as D to E and then from F to G we have a uniform deceleration because it ends up at 0 meters per second and that's in the opposite direction again because we're still below the x-axis. Part B says to sketch the corresponding acceleration time graph. Now just like in question 2 we first need to find the acceleration at each stage on the graph and there's going to be 6 accelerations here because there's 6 different parts on our velocity time graph. Now from B to C first of all if we look back at our velocity time graph B to C was a constant velocity and so was e to f in actual fact. So we're going to need to say that those are both 0 meters per second squared for the acceleration because remember if they are a constant velocity they cannot be accelerating as well so they must have a 0 acceleration. So we can say for b to c that a equals 0 meters per second squared and we can say the same for e to f which is that a equals 0 meters per second squared because of the constant velocity. a to b now the uniform acceleration we have the a equals question mark u equals 0 meters per second, the final velocity is 10 meters per second and the time is 4 seconds. So we then write down our equation for acceleration, a equals v minus u over t, substituting in the numbers we get 10 minus 0 over 4, which when you put into your calculator gives you an answer of 2.5 meters per second squared. For lines c to d we have a equals question mark, u equals 10 meters per second and the final velocity is 0 meters per second with a time of 4 seconds. Writing down our equation we have a equals v minus u over t, Substituting in the numbers gives 0 minus 10 over 4 and then that gives a final answer of minus 2.5 meters per second squared. Now doing the same for d to e, we have the a equals question mark, u equals 0 meters per second, v equals minus 10 meters per second because remember we're below the x-axis now and time is equal to 2 seconds. So writing down our equation a equals v minus u over t, we have minus 10 minus 0 over 2 which gives an answer of minus 5.0 meters per second squared. Lastly f to g we have a equals question mark, u equals minus 10 meters per second, v equals 0 meters per second and t equals 2 seconds. So putting that into our equation a equals v minus u over t, we have 0 minus minus 10 which is going to give us plus 10 divided by 2 is equal to 5.0 meters per second squared. Now what we need to do is our acceleration time graph, so we've got 6 values for acceleration, so we're going to have 6 red lines on our acceleration time graph. So sketching our axes first of all, we can then put in our labels of a in meters per second squared and time in seconds. Now we need to put in our numbers that are of interest so that we can draw our lines. So we have our acceleration values of 0, 2.5, 5.0 
and minus 2.5 and minus 5.0 and then we're looking specifically at the times of 4, 6, 10, 12, 14 and 16 seconds. So between 0 and 4 seconds we have a uniform acceleration of 2.5 meters per second squared and then from 4 to 6 seconds we have an acceleration of 0. From 6 to 10 seconds we then have an acceleration of minus 2.5 meters per second squared and now we get to the motion below the graph. So for this our first acceleration value is minus 5.0 meters per second squared from 10 to 12 seconds. Then from 12 to 14 seconds we have another acceleration of 0 meters per second squared and then from 14 to 16 seconds we have an acceleration of 5.0 meters per second squared. This looks pretty complicated but hopefully you've managed to follow along and see how we've broken it up into parts and you'll notice we have the six red lines which correspond to the six acceleration values that we've calculated. Question 4 says that a ball is thrown vertically upwards at 9.8 meters per second. One second later it reaches its highest point. The motion of the ball is described by a velocity time graph which is shown below. So we've got velocity in meters per second and we've got time in seconds. And you'll see that after one second it's reached its highest point over here which is when the velocity becomes zero. So part A asks what feature distinguishes this graph from a speed time graph? Well, it's the fact that you would not have negative values in a speed time graph. So the fact that we've gone below the axis showing motion in the opposite direction to the initial direction means that we have a velocity time graph rather than a speed time graph. Part B says to calculate the acceleration from 0 to 1 second. So if we look back at the graph, we need to calculate the acceleration from here to here, which is going to be a deceleration because we've got a negatively sloping line on our graph. So if we write down what we know from the question, we have A equals question mark, U equals 9.8 meters per second, V equals 0 meters per second where it gets to its highest point and time equals 1 second. So putting that into our equation A equals V minus U over T, we have 0 minus 9.8 divided by 1 which gives us an answer of minus 9.8 meters per second squared and it's negative as we expected. Part C now asks to calculate the acceleration from 1 to 2 seconds. So if we look back at that graph, you'll see that we're now looking at this line here from 1 to 2 seconds. So we want to note the acceleration value here. Remember that now we're below the x-axis, we're going to be using this negative 9.8 value as our final speed because it ends up here after 2 seconds. So the initial speed we're going to use is 0 meters per second and the final speed is going to be minus 9.8. So writing down what we know from the question, we're trying to find the acceleration. We know that the initial speed is 0 meters per second and V equals minus 9.8 meters per second. T is 1 second. Now putting that into our equation, we have A equals V minus U over T, which gives us minus 9.8 minus 0 divided by 1, which again gives us an answer of minus 9.8 meters per second squared. Now the reason we've got the same answer is because the ball thrown up into the air is going to be experiencing the exact same acceleration due to gravity downwards at a rate of minus 9.8 meters per second squared, assuming we choose upwards to be positive and downwards to be negative. So that acceleration is not going to change. Lastly, part D asks how high did the ball go? So we're going to have to try and work out a distance here, a magnitude of a displacement. So remember the way we find distance or magnitude of displacement from a velocity time graph is we need to calculate the area under the graph. So the ball reaches a maximum height after one second which is halfway through its motion. So we can work out how high it's going by using the motion from zero to one second. So finding the area under the velocity time graph from zero to one second means we do distance equals area under VT graph and it's a triangle so we have a half times base times height which gives us a half times 1 times 9.8 which gives us a vertical height of 4.9 meters. The last question, question 5, says that a ball is dropped from rest at a certain height above the ground. It bounces on impact and continues to bounce until it comes to a stop. Part A asks to sketch a velocity time graph for this bouncing ball. Now the first thing to notice in this question is that there's no mention of air resistance being negligible, so we must take it into account. So that means that the ball is going to lose energy after each successive bounce, meaning that it will eventually come to a stop, just like it would in real life. So we need to choose our sign convention first of all. You can do this question in two ways. You can either define it upwards to be positive, or you could define upwards to be negative to begin with. So what we're going to do is take upwards to be positive and downwards to be negative. You can however consider downwards to be positive because that is the way the ball is going to move to begin with and just like we did in the theory it sometimes makes sense to do that. So in this example we're going to take upwards to be positive and downwards to be negative. So we can sketch our axis first of all and then put in our labels. So we have V in meters per second, our origin down here and time in seconds. Now we're not asked for numerical values in the graph so we don't have to put in any numbers. So because we've defined downwards to be negative we're going to show the first line going below the x-axis into the negative velocity. 
size. So what it's going to look like is this to begin with. So the ball starts from rest at 0 meters per second in your hand and when you drop it it's going to start accelerating. So it's going to accelerate but it's going downwards so we've drawn it below the axis and then eventually at this point here it's going to change direction quickly. The reason it changes direction quickly is because it's going to hit the ground and it's then going to try and come back up away from the ground. So this purple line here just shows a quick change in direction. Now what's then going to happen is the speed of that ball is then going to decrease as it comes up from the ground until it eventually reaches zero meters per second at its highest point. At this point it's then going to start repeating the motion in exactly the same way as before. But remember we said it's going to lose energy because we're not ignoring air resistance here. So after each bounce, we're going to have to show that the maximum velocity that ball reaches is decreasing as time goes on. So I'm just going to fill in the rest because the motion is now just going to repeat and repeat and repeat until eventually the ball comes to a stop. So you'll notice that as we go from here to here to here to here, the motion then just repeats, repeats and repeats until the ball eventually comes to a stop. So just to recap, the ball leaves your hand and accelerates towards the ground until it hits the ground at which there is a quick change in direction. At this point, the ball is then going to start decreasing in speed, slowing down as it comes up to its highest point. At its highest point, it's then going to be at zero meters per second, and then it's going to start falling down the way again, which is going to increase in speed towards the ground. Then it, when it hits the ground again, it's going to quickly change direction, and then that's just going to keep repeating and so on. Now notice that the peaks of the velocity, going from here to here to here to here and so on, are getting smaller and smaller. And that's because we said the ball is going to lose energy due to friction and due to air resistance. So the height at which the ball will reach after each bounce is not going to be as high. And that's what you would expect when you drop a bouncing ball in real life. Part B says to sketch the corresponding acceleration time graph. So we're not asked for any numerical values here, but let's just write down the axis first of all. We can then put in our labels of acceleration in meters per second squared and time in seconds. Seconds. We've also got the origin, but you don't need any numerical labels. And then we're going to just sketch what the acceleration time graph would look like. So it's going to be a negative value. I've just put in minus 9.8, although you don't have to. And the reason we've got a straight horizontal line for the acceleration time graph at minus 9.8 is because for this bouncing ball, the acceleration due to gravity is going to act on it at all times. So that is why we have a constant acceleration at minus 9.8, and that's not going to change. Remember, in higher physics, we don't use anything other than constant accelerations. That's all for this video, guys. I hope you found it useful. If you did, give it one of these, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Whoa!